Coming up on DTNS, our notes on the new Galaxy Notes. And there are two of them. Actually, kind of four of them. FedEx breaks up with Amazon and tardigrades on the moon. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, August 7th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Mary. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. While my wife is in Los Angeles, I'm in Salt Lake City, and I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. <laughs> made it made it real awkward for me there, Scott. I know, it's weird. She's there. Oh, She's there she, is. she just happens to be there somewhere. So look out. Look out. <laughs> Uh, hey, if you are a subscriber to Good Day Internet, which you can get through our Patreon, patreon.com slash DTNS, you uh, got to hear us just talk about javelinas and, and jasmine green tea and honeysuckle and all kinds of good stuff. Well, let's start right now with a few tech things you should know. In advance of the announcement of its Galaxy Note 10, which we will talk about in great detail later in the show, Samsung released details of the Exynos 9825 processor. The 9825 is built on a 7 nanometer extreme ultraviolet and uses the same Cheetah M4 cores and Mali G76 GPU as the 9820. It includes an LTE modem with a potential maximum of 2 gigabits per second, along with neural processing unit for AI and augmented reality. The government of Kazakhstan said Tuesday it's stopping a requirement for mobile phone operators to ask customers to install an encryption certificate that gave the government permission to access all encrypted data. Several lawyers sued Kazakhstan through uh, three uh, sued their three mobile carriers over threats to restrict Internet access to those that did not install the certificate. Kazakhstan's state security committee said the program was a test to see. Uh, or uh, sorry, a test that is now over and users can uninstall the certificate. It's just a test. We were just kidding. Yeah. We don't sue us. Uh, the information reports Apple will only let iOS apps run voice over internet protocol in the background during a call. In other words, if you're not using the app, it's not going to let it do background stuff. The change will arrive with iOS 13 in September. Existing apps will be given until April 2020 to comply. VoIP in the background can connect your calls quicker because it can keep things hot. It can also potentially collect information on you. Uh, and Apple's trying to guard against that. Disney announced that when Disney Plus launches on November 12th, it's going to offer a bundle for $12.99 per month that includes content from not only Disney Plus, but Hulu and ESPN Plus as well, which, if you put them all together, is about $5 less than if the services were subscribed to separately. So if you like all of them, you're going to save some money. Disney also announced a 10-episode Star Wars series with Jon Favreau, which will be available at launch. Yeah, we knew that was coming. Uh, yeah, that's the Mandalorian, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Motherboard reports that Microsoft contractors manually review some voice recordings from Skype's automated translation feature and Cortana's voice assistant in order to improve performance. So put Microsoft on the board next to Amazon, Google, and Apple. Microsoft does not associate reviewed data with user accounts. Uh, and if you're keeping track, Google and Apple recently suspended their programs. Amazon has added the ability to opt out of having recordings reviewed. Microsoft discloses that it uses voice data to improve systems for both Skype and Cortana, but it does not explicitly say humans may listen to select recordings. Microsoft says it gets customer permission before collecting and using voice data. All right, let's talk a little more about Ninja. How's Ninja doing over there at Mixer, Scott? Well, uh, another Microsoft property, funny enough. Uh, five days after leaving Twitch to begin streaming on Microsoft's Mixer exclusively. If you don't know who Ninja is, uh, he was a gigantic uh, force to be reckoned with on, on uh, uh, Twitch and other platforms. His real name is Tyler Ninja Blevins, the Ninja Parts nickname. He has reached 1 million active Mixer subscriptions. New subscribers to Ninja's Mixer and get two months free before they need to pay the monthly fee of at least $5.99 for perks. That uh, doesn't mean you can't use the service for free. You can. Blevins has 22 million YouTube subscribers to his channel as well. Um, so other platforms still have huge numbers for him. This is a gigantic move for him and his fans. And I think it actually did what Microsoft intended. People still don't quite know what he paid for this or what they paid for this. Um, they do know what he was making on Twitch. So uh, there's some pretty good ideas about the kind of money that was thrown around to get Ninja to do this. But in other words, more. <laughs> yeah, more yeah. is what happened. More we will happened. Be, we will beat that number, sir. Yeah. And you people are very enough wealthy. People, enough people that appears went over with him, you know, his loyal fans. That's not quite the sub number he had on Twitch, but you know, it's great for a few days. And uh, I would I would say anecdotally anyway, a lot of people I've talked to have gone and checked the service out out of pure curiosity, not even necessarily followers of Ninja, 
They just thought, well, let's see what the hubbub is. Let's go look at this thing. And I think that's what Microsoft wanted with all of this is just to get their service in people, people's eyes, let them see the UI, let them see how it works, let them see the differences. Because up till now, it's kind of been a lot of my platforms better than your platform, and I'm never even going to look at yours sort of problem. Yeah, it's a great marketing strategy, really. I mean, if, if if he has loyal followers who will move to another platform because he does, great. And Microsoft is like, well, we're going to get some of those folks. But hopefully, even the folks that, I don't know, may, this, this may not be a match made in heaven for him on this other platform might say, well, Mixer was pretty great. So it was it was successful advertising. Yeah, I would I also say real quick, this this people are always looking for a good comparison to this. This reminds me of when Howard Stern left syndicated air you know over the air radio and went to xm or, or rather serious uh that was it, it had its a desired effect at the time a ton of people went over there a bunch of people got it uh serious because here's where howard's gonna be but that also slowed down after a while and i don't know where it's at now it's probably kind of flat uh so i don't know what the long term looks like but as far as a quick boost i think they kind of got what they wanted yeah will uh ninja be howard stern or bob edwards stay tuned <laughs> to find out uh, in two months, in two months, we'll, we'll, we'll find out if these, these free users stick around and pay. Yeah. FedEx will not renew its ground delivery contract with Amazon when it expires at the end of this month. FedEx's express stopped us air shipments for Amazon back in June. And the company still has a contract with Amazon for international deliveries, but FedEx is reducing its dependence on Amazon while Amazon builds out its own logistics network and air capacity. FedEx will focus on providing more service to other e-commerce companies, including more drop-off and pickup points with companies like Dollar General, also putting some more uh, focus into Walmart as well, which is a big Amazon competitor. Amazon made up about 1.3% of FedEx's sales last year. Yeah, so this is interesting because uh, it's FedEx saying, you can't fire me, I quit. Uh, we're, we're not going to renew the contract before you can dump us before we're too dependent on you. And I think that that is a wise thought. Uh, the idea is that FedEx is going to continue to develop partnerships like they're doing with Dollar General. They want to be the e-commerce deliverer for the many e-commerce companies that aren't able to create their own air fleets uh, and their own trucking situations like Amazon is. Uh, and I think that is also smart. UPS continues to to have a huge number, uh, of, a huge percentage of, of their, uh, maybe I shouldn't say huge, they have a big percentage of their business coming Roger from Amazon. FedEx, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Postal and, and service to, as well. They're going to continue to have a big percentage because uh, of the departure of FedEx, but we'll, we'll see if that ends up biting UPS uh, in the brown later. <laughs> in the brown well, uh, Am <laughs> it's my favorite thing you've ever said um <laughs> amazon it says here made up 1.3 percent of fedex's sales last year i'm a little i know that that number represents a lot of money yeah but i'm a little surprised how small that number is i thought that would be no, much more than a worldwide that. company don't forget like this this is you know around the world fedex has millions of of clients so 1.3 percent isn't enough to to lose and, and get rid of uh, FedEx. And don't forget, they're still doing international stuff for Amazon. So they'll still have a big percentage of their business going to Amazon. Um, Although so, how long yeah. is that going to last? Because it seems like FedEx right? is like, you know what? We're just going to do better decoupling ourselves from some a, a huge company that's only on the up and up when it comes to, to what we actually do and have done for many decades ourselves. Mm -hmm. It, it is interesting. I think what caught my eye about this story is thinking about Amazon as being in competition with these shippers that they have relied on to build their business. Uh, there's so many parallels to other things where they're like, wait, you used us to get successful and now you're competing with us. Well, in the news of big video game companies, the big three, in fact, Microsoft, Sony and Nintendo will require all game publishers to disclose the odds of receiving types of in-game items from loot boxes and future titles. One would think this would include other things other than loot boxes, card decks, that kind of stuff as well. But we'll have to wait and see. The Entertainment Software Association, which uh, all three companies belong to, announced the new initiative at a loot box workshop <laughs> at the Federal Trade Commission. <laughs> uh, some video game publishers already include drop rates and others such as Activision, Blizzard, Bandai Namco, Bethesda, Bungie, EA, Take-Two Interactive, Ubisoft and Warner Brothers and Wizard of the Coast have agreed to do so by the end of 2020. Uh, the Xbox, PlayStation, and Nintendo Switch are included in the uh, commitment, but not PC games. That's a little more of a Wild West kind of scenario. Um, I do want to say uh, in all of this, this this comes at a time where you're also seeing 
some other news come in about people, uh, developers and publishers dropping loot boxes altogether as a monetization method. Um, and some of them are big, like for yeah, example, like Rocket yeah, Rocket League yesterday or two days ago, I forget now. Yesterday, yeah, we talked about it in Good Day Internet right after the show. Yeah, they made a they made a bit of a splash with that announcement. Um, they haven't been super well, a little forthcoming about what their plans are, but it's basically a battle pass. And I thought this would be an interesting way to at least put out there this idea that, or at least my theory, that more and more developers, publishers, regardless of how much their games may currently rely on loot boxes as their monetization method, I think you're going to move away from chance-based uh, item getting and move to something like a battle pass that you see in almost every single uh, battle royale game, uh, most notably Fortnite. Uh, those are, I think, a fairer, more sort of laid out option for consumers. They see it and they know exactly what they're going to get. You pay 10, 15 bucks, whatever it is. And you know, for this amount of time that I'm going to unlock this amount of items. And if I play a lot, I'm going to do this much faster than anybody else. But you know what you're going to get and when you're going to get it. And they take that kind of roll of the dice out of there. Taking the games out of gaming. Kind of, well, they're taking some the of games. them anyway. Yeah, letting the, the game be the game, not yeah, the them, amount right. <laughs> Taking some chance out of your gaming experience. The mini, yeah. the mini game within the game, if you want to call it that, is absolutely, I think, going to go away. So, in some ways, all this discussion about releasing numbers for chances of winning and all that sort of stuff, I think, is going to become moot at some point because I really do believe there are better options and some that haven't been explored yet for consumers to pay that are more fair that don't have all this scrutiny, that don't have all these problems, and it will end up being a problem that kind of kills itself. Kills itself or solves itself? Solves itself, sorry, it's bad to use a term there. I would say yeah. I would say that this is, this is a good thing that everybody's focused on it, that people are worried about it. I actually think this is really healthy. It keeps things in line, it makes us sort of go, all right, well, let's discuss what's good, what's not. In the meantime, other innovations are happening, and as those have happened, I think they're ready to pick them right up. A game like Overwatch, for example, which relies entirely on loot boxes as their monetization method post game sale, could just turn around tomorrow and do a battle pass, something like that, and have players glom onto it in a heartbeat. I would. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll see how it goes. All right, everybody, let's talk about warshipping. You might say, what's warshipping? Well, security researchers at IBM's X-Force Red say that warshipping can be a very effective way for an attacker to gain access to a target's network just by packaging up a device and then shipping it through the mail. Maybe they would even use FedEx. The researchers developed a proof of concept device the size of a small phone equipped with a 3G modem that could be remote controlled through cell service. So the device would periodically scan for nearby networks when it reached its destination's front door or maybe a mail room or maybe a loading dock. Then the researchers could run tools to either passively or actively attack the target's wireless access. The device, also known as a warship, uh, would listen for some kind of a handshake, uh, you know, somebody getting Wi-Fi access, say, and then sends the scrambled data back to the attacker's servers, which are going to be a lot faster than this 3G modem small device, to try to crack the hash into a readable Wi-Fi password. And this is all done before anybody even opens up the package. And there's sort of the genius part of this. Yeah, the the idea being you you do this fast, right? It, it's done at internet speed, and and once, yeah, you could you could do it by walking up to a target, but maybe you don't live in the same country or something. Uh, sure. Yeah. The, the other weakness I could see in this is if somebody does open up the package, they're going to see that there's all this electronics in there, uh, and possibly ask the IT department, you know, what's that about? Or they're going to freak out, right, and be sure. like, is this a bomb or something? A lot of attention is going to be called to a package like that, at which point uh, your security uh, engineers hopefully will start combing the network looking for an intrusion. So the smart thing to do if you're the attacker would be to send this to somebody who no longer works there yeah. so that it just sits around in the yeah, mail. Yeah, it takes right? a minute for somebody like, to oh, get right. curious enough. Package? It's meant for Bob, but Bob like, isn't here anymore. I, I, yeah. I will say anecdotally, I'm. this might be effective with some office or uh, office building mail rooms, but the ones I've... In the offices I've worked at, the mail rooms have always been dead zones for cell phone activity. So mm. if companies want to be proactive, just bury the mail room at the bottom 
of the building where the foundation yeah, and the but the package is. isn't gonna always be in the mail room right yeah, like it might be on a door it can happen fast so it just needs to know it's close enough to the building to get that wi-fi access point and then it can it can get in there super fast and i'm by no means a target but i've got two boxes over here on this table that i've had for a week because i haven't had time to look and see what's in them different case obviously but that's what you'll see you'll see people at their desks who are like oh, i don't have time for this that's from so and so, or that's a thing, or whatever. I'm just going to look at it later, and it would just so, sort of sit there and stew. Right. right. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, your idea of having a Faraday cage around anything yeah. <laughs> makes, I think, makes well, sense. That's what an it, office building is, and 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 inspecting packages that are to you know that are not being delivered uh, to make sure, like, wait a minute, this was sent to Bobby, doesn't work here anymore. What's that about? But there are rules about opening other people's mail, right? So uh, th this is done by IBM X Force Red. Uh, as a penetration test method, when they're going in and and trying to see if a company's network is secure, this is one of the things they've been doing uh, to try to penetrate the network and see if there are weaknesses. I smell Should a business opportunity. If anyone's interested, I'm going to create a line of variable size <laughs> lead line delivery boxes. <laughs> I'm sure that would be very affordable and economic. Wait, why, well, how how would that help? Well, yeah, because you, the well, attacker is not going to want to use them. Well, no, no, no. Attacker is like, going to use a When you box. get something shipped, you, instead of just leaving it on your porch, whatever, you drop it in the box. That's in your ah, house. Oh, so, oh, oh, would put oh, yeah, I see. That's, yeah, a box it. for right. the boxes. Like well, a left line storage box for undelivered yes, packages. correct. Yeah. Right. No, I'm with you now. That's Got not it. bad. That way you're not erasing something you may actually want. It, you're mm -hmm. just limiting its ability to you're get not out. You're violating postal rules by opening somebody else's mail. The other, the other concern I would have is that these are just going to get smaller. So they said it's about the size of a cell phone. That's going to get significantly smaller to the point, Tom, that I could send you a package that looked like it was for you. I gave you a bunch oh, of you're gonna Oreo. Send me one of those novelty gift cards that yep. plays music when it opens, but that's the chip right. also has a 3G or a 5G modem. Right that's right. That stuff's just getting thinner and easier. So mm -hmm. I don't want to freak anyone out, but just Scott, get... open up your packages. I'm worried. <laughs> I'm going Careful. To... <laughs> I think one has hot sauce in it and the other one has Oreos for real. So that'd be <laughs> fine. Uh, the BBC reports on an Israeli spacecraft that crashed intentionally on the moon in April, carrying a payload of dehydrated tardigrades, some of which were encased in amber. Tardigrades, if you don't know, uh, are also sometimes called water bears, or I just learned today from the BBC, sometimes called moss piglets can reduce metabolism to 0.01% of their normal rate and be reanimated decades after dehydration. These are these are living creatures. They are living creatures that can stay dehydrated and then become alive. I mean, they're still alive, uh, but, but become active again yeah. with a little bit of water. Now, the mission to the moon was part of the Arch Mission's Lunar Library, uh, it included a uh, DVD with lots of information about uh, humanity, uh, DNA samples, et cetera. The Arch Mission Foundation is dedicated to preserving flora and fauna of Earth by storing it in space. They want to send these packages to multiple parts of the solar system in order to, to have a, a, a sort of a security blanket, kind of like the seed vault up in Svalbard, which unfortunately is now threatened because Svalbard's melting and it's getting too hot to store the seeds properly. Uh, this is like, hey, let's let's store a little bit about humanity to let whoever comes next know we were here. A lot of people are upset about this, though, because they took great pains when they visited the moon to not contaminate the moon with anything from Earth, if possible. And these folks just put a bunch of dehydrated tardigrades on the surface right they don't get into the crash process so i don't know how that works how all your moss piglets uh survive a well i mean they're crash. dehydrated the, the crash thing just means that they they didn't have a soft landing but but essentially don't worry don't focus too much on the crash it didn't hurt the tardigrades they were already dehydrated all right good and amber. all right good <laughs> so, the, so the tardigrades are okay here's what's going to happen we're gonna we're gonna keep polluting our local space systems and then one day we're going to get to the moon and go, all right, time for a base. And Lord High tar Tardigrade is going to come walking out of a cave at eight <laughs> size and he's going to kill us. He's going to just laser us down. And one that. got out and drifted until it found some some liquid water on the moon somehow and then mutated. Yeah, no, I, I see where you're going. It's... Yeah, I mean, how how tough is this amber they're encased in? Yeah, I don't know. The Tardigrades might not, not do all much. Not murdered encased in amber if I read this right either. So, yeah. Well, it's, it's fascinating. It's not like they went up there and put a bunch of beer cans. I mean, this is a... I mean, besides, we left bits of a <laughs> rover, a flag, a lunar landing module. There's some, there's some footsteps. Have any living, 
we, as far as we know, we took we took great pains to make sure that those didn't carry anything that would that would be left behind. And yes, Soviet. I, I feel for the tardigrade community. <laughs> I think it's I think it's okay. We're not living on the moon. They can have it. Yeah. I can't and wait it, for the future theme park. We're tardigrades on the moon. That's yep. right. I mean, we're yep. all going to Mars. We're going to bypass the moon anyway. It's, it's it's a nice gesture. Yeah. I look forward to the Moss Piglet ride, Tom. I think it'll be great. <laughs> Moss Piglet That's is just nice. funny. Moss so Piglet. Low. Band name. Hey, folks, if you want to get all tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. Samsung very inconsiderately announced the Galaxy Note 10 a mere 50 minutes ago, but thankfully let the NDA expire right at the beginning of their announcement. So we're able to bring you all of our thoughts on the new notes. Uh, there is a Samsung Galaxy Note 10 and a Note 10 Plus. If you want a stylus but not a massive phone, the Note 10 is for you. If you want the true heir to the Note 9, you probably want the Note 10 Plus. Here are the differences. The Note 10 has a 6.3 inch screen. So it's actually a little smaller than the Note 9. Uh, it's an HDR10 plus certified OLED screen. It's a very nice screen. 3,500 milliamp hour battery. A little smaller battery too. Starts at $949. A little smaller price too. Eight gigabytes of RAM, 256 gigabytes of storage. Now, the Na Galaxy Note 10 plus is what you would have expected. 6.8 inch screen, also HDR10 plus certified OLED, 4,300 milliamp hour battery, starts at $1,099, 12 gigabytes of RAM, 256 gigabytes of storage, or if you wanna pay 1199, you can get 512 gigabytes of storage. And the uh, it supports power adapters up to 45 watts for some pretty fast charging. Now, those are the differences. Both of these notes, share an Exynos proper uh, processor like we talked about in some markets, but most markets will get the Snapdragon 855. The S Pen did not come with a camera in it, like many rumors thought, uh, but does have Bluetooth LE, an accelerometer, and a gyroscope. So it can do motion control. It can do a little bit of hover action, mostly with photos, it seems right now. They they say they're going to make the dev kit available for others. We'll see. Uh, the screen has uh, tone mapping. It's dynamic AMOLED. Uh, there's a wide angle camera at 16 megapixels. The main camera is 12 megapixels, dual aperture. Telephoto camera is 12 megapixels. And then the selfie camera on the front front is 10 megapixels, has LTE CAT 2.0, of course, in it, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth 5, an in-screen fingerprint sensor. So there's no fingerprint sensor on the back on the note anymore. And the one that will make Neelai and many other people cry, no headphone jack. Now, Samsung claims that's how they got the 4,300 milliamp hour battery in there. They were able to add, add a few more amps because they had more space for the battery. They also say that the haptic feedback should be improved because they don't have to work around the hollow cavity uh, from the phone jack inside. Your mileage may vary whether you believe them or not. Uh, no dongle. We talked about the fact that they might include a dongle. No, the dongle is sold separately. If you want to have the mini jack to USB-C adapter, that's 10 bucks. They will include USB-C headphones in the box. No more Bixby button. Unlike the headphone jack, I doubt many people will be sad about this. If you do want to use Bixby stuff, long press on the power button now. Uh, the notes will come in four colors. You've uh, got improved video stabilization because apparently they ping the sensor more often. Uh, there's a little nifty thing in there for using the three mics to do some beam forming and isolate the audio coming from where you're pointing the camera so that you get better audio from what you're shooting. Pre-ordering starts today, shipping August 23rd. Uh, and if you want a Note 10 5G, you're basically getting the Note 10 Plus with 5G. Pre-orders for that start August 10th. Shipping also August 23rd for $1,300 from Verizon for a limited time. It'll eventually come to other carriers in the U.S. as well. Otherwise, uh, that's pretty much like the Note 10 Plus. And the other thing I want to note here is the Dex app, which lets you use your Samsung phone like a desktop by uh, connecting it to, to keyboard and mouse is now going to have an app for Mac and Windows that will allow you to plug the Note 10 or 10 Plus into your computer and get a window with all your phone apps in it. This will not work with the S10. This will only work with the Note, uh, but it will let you drag and drop files and it will have built-in support for Microsoft's Your Phone for Windows 10. So there you go. Uh, the, new, the Note 10 Plus definitely seems like the heir to the Note uh, and the new Note 10 is sort of for people who don't want the bigness of the note, but they want the stylus. Yeah. Uh, 
I'll just say it. That is a hot phone. <laughs> like there's a lot in there and it sounds really good to me. Uh, I think the size sounds great. I think everything you described in the spec sounds great. Like I am, I am all for that device. Actually, weirdly, I'm a kind of an Apple iPhone guy. I'm not trying to make this about Apple. But you I'm do just, like a stylus I, too. I do like a stylus and, you know, quick sketches on the go. That's interesting to me. Um, I don't know. Like, I really need to see that new tablet they're working on. Like, there's a lot of stuff happening under the hood over there at, at Samsung that has me a little bit interested this time around. But um, what a what a gorgeous device that thing looks like. You can like. use that S Pen like a wand. It's basically, you can you can do, like, gestures and stuff with it. It's pretty interesting. Six can X I, motion sensor in there. Can I do magic with it? Because if not. I mean, if you're playing the Harry Potter game, yeah, probably. Hey, I didn't think of that. Although I right, <laughs> now you convinced me. I mean, Sarah, does this push you any <laughs> closer to a Samsung uh, phone that thinks a monster? Well, it certainly doesn't push me away. You, you know, I know that people get upset about the no headphone jack, although many devices are moving in that direction. And I've been complaining about this for years and I've gotten over it. I've got my dongle. Seven or it's 10 bucks for a dongle. It's not free, but it's not going to break the bank either. Not having a Bixby Bux button makes perfect sense to me. A long press on the power button, you know, after a week, you'd forget that you ever wanted a Bixby button in the first place, mm. Bixby. And I venture a guess that not a lot of people wanted it to begin with. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, this is a nice device. It's not cheap, but it's priced competitively to, to other uh, uh, high end phones in this arena. And, I know a lot of people are pretty pretty happy about this unpacked event. Yeah, I I also can we all stop complaining about phones that don't have headphone jacks because now they're going to start all not having them and then we can put that to bed. I want to be done with it. It's like floppy drives in the '90s and uh, CD drives here lately. Let's like just be done with that conversation. I'm glad Samsung's going toward a future where we're just going to be wireless with our headphone our headphones and people are going to be mad at me for this. Don't email Tom. I don't want him to have to defend me. You can tell me <laughs> on Twitter. But I, I uh, am infinitely annoyed that people are annoyed by headphone jacks being taken away. It's fine. It's the natural progression. It's this old analog thing. So I well, like. Well, I mean, I'm wearing really nice headphones that I would actually use more if they could plug into my current phone. So mm -hmm. I get it. I get, you know, you might just have some gear where you're like, man, now I got to have a dongle and there's a whole thing. But uh, I'm, I'm with you. Wireless all the way. Take that, Tom. <laughs> All right, good luck. Good luck. With that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Scott and I will weather the storm. <laughs> the moon creatures will help us. Yes. Thanks okay. to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Whether you like headphone jacks or not, we're glad to have you. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. We've got a group there, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. I would say let's check out the mailbag, but it's from Twitter. Today. It is. In fact, Gadget Smart on Twitter. Very good Twitter handle. I wonder how long you've been on Twitter. Uh, uh, I replied Roger and me and Tom from our GDI conversation yesterday. We were talking about the idea of putting cups on coasters and when you should do that and when it's okay not to. So and everybody had a different opinion. A leaky cup. That, that, I, I that. had a leaky cup. I told a story, and everyone said, "Well, you should have used a coaster." So uh, Gadget Smart said, "I got a got a solution. Uh, something called Hydro Flask tumblers." He says, "It's not my employer. No affiliation link. If you go to hydroflask.com/spirits, you'll see what I mean. It appears that these are more designed to just keep your drinks cool and keep the ice from." Uh, you know, condensation getting on the outside, but I guess that also works as a coaster as well. Uh, well, yeah, because they they don't because of the way they're constructed, they supposedly don't have condensation buildup on the outside. So yeah, you don't get the ring. Yeah, I uh, hydro flasks are a thing. We've talked about it on it's a thing actually. Uh, they they're huge right now, so I'm not I'm not surprised that this would come up as the solution. Uh, bringing bringing reality to Gadget Smart's Twitter name. Yeah, uh, knowing that their slogan is savor every sip. There because it doesn't warm up. Yeah, there you go. Mm. Yeah. Or maybe I just drink everything out of my travel coffee mug where nothing cools down. <laughs> By the way, Rumwald did say this in chat yesterday. Insulated cups don't sweat. So credit oh. your credits all right. Well, all right. Replace all your cups and then you don't have to put your coffee mug on a book and ruin your nightstand. And listen to GDI for more stories like this. Uh, thanks to Gadget Smart and everybody who gave us good ideas uh, about uh, coasterless life. And also thanks to Scott Johnson for being with us today. Scott, what is new? 
Oh, nothing's new, really. A lot of the same old, but a lot of good same old. So if you're interested in podcasts or art or other cool things that might be happening in my little uh, tiny sector of the internet, you can go check me out at frogpants.com. And if you want to yell at me about uh, headphone jacks, you can do that on Twitter at Scott Johnson. And if you're a patron of patreon.com slash DTNS in your feed right now already, maybe some of you already listened to it, is a deep dive interview about Libra with Tanya Evans uh, from UNH Franklin Pierce School of Law. She is uh, the, the dean uh, of a department there. Uh, she runs uh, a program that is certifying lawyers on expertise uh, in this area. And she had a lot of great insight into what's up with Libra, what we should really be concerned about, what the future of it might be, who else might be doing similar things like this. Uh, that will come to everyone this Saturday. But if you want to get to listen to it right now, go sign up, patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at Daily Tech News Show dot com and we love to get your feedback we're also live monday through friday 4 30 p.m eastern 2030 utc find out more and tell a friend dailytechnewsshow.com slash live back tomorrow with justin robert young talk to you then this show is part of the frog pants network get more at frogpants.com diamond club hopes you have enjoyed this program <laughs>